Welcome. Today's presentation is part of the Healing Together series. It was created in collaboration with the Office of Prevention and Intervention, School Counseling Team, and the STEP program. Are you in tune with yourself? Let's find out. Today's workshop will focus on identifying your life stressors, learning about coping skills and developing your own to meet your needs. We will also discuss support plans and you will learn how to create your own. And lastly, we will help guide you in transferring these skills to other peers, staff, and most importantly, our students. Here is the agenda and the order in which the presentation will go. First, we will explore triggers. Then we'll discuss and create coping skills. After that will be self inventories, creating support plans, how to use them, when to use them, and lastly, how to do all of this on your own. So let's get started. Triggers. I'm sure you thought of a few of your own as soon as I said the word. Much like your body requires a balanced diet and exercise to maintain its health, your mental health also needs attention. One way to ensure you are taking care of your mental health is to learn your triggers and the best way to respond to them. First, we identify the problem. Describe the problem your trigger triggers are contributing to. Can think to yourself, what is the worst case scenario if you are exposed to your triggers? Just about anything can be a trigger. To begin exploring your own, think about each of the categories listed below. Is there a specific emotion that acts as a trigger for you? How about a person or a place? Taking the time out to identify your triggers will help you develop useful coping skills that you can utilize when needed. So how will this help you? Well, here are some brief ways that learning about your triggers and developing coping skills to respond to them can help you throughout your day. And here's some tips. Oftentimes, the best way to deal with the trigger is to avoid it. But as we know, that is not always an option for us. So this may look like making changes where you can to your lifestyle, relationships, or daily routine. You'll want to be prepared to deal with them head on just in case avoidance isn't possible. Your strategy might include coping skills, which you're going to learn about in the next portion of this presentation, a list of trusted people you could talk to, or even some rehearsed phrases to help get you out of a troublesome situation. And don't wait until the heat of the moment to test your coping strategy. Practice as often as you can. So what are coping skills? I am sure you have heard the word coping skills millions of times. The talk of coping skills is everywhere. Simply put, we cope thousands of times throughout the day without realizing it. We cope when we slam on our brakes for the car that stopped abruptly ahead of us and that caused our hearts to race. We cope when we've had a bad performance review, but keep our composure in the moment. We cope when our homes and worlds feel completely out of control and nothing feels normal or the way it used to. Coping skills are any techniques we utilize in the moment to regulate our bodies, our reactions, and our thoughts. Understanding your coping skills will help you refine your everyday go-tos. For example, my everyday go-to is to focus on my breathing when I realize I've actually been holding my breath during a stressful conversation. I simply pause, realize that I've been taking shallow breaths, and begin to focus on inhaling and exhaling. Another go-to can be counting steps while you're walking. Rather than allowing your mind to think about everything that you need to get done for your next task, 
counting steps can help focus on the moment and not let your mind wander. Everyone copes differently. The thought of counting steps and breaths might not sound appealing to you, and that's okay. It's important to figure out what you are already naturally doing and make those an everyday intentional practice. There are many lists of pre-made coping skills that you can use to share with your students when creating social support plans. For example, a coping skill can be as simple as A, ask for help, G, go to your happy place, or V, voice your concerns. In addition to identifying and utilizing coping skills as a way to self-regulate, Using self-inventory is a support method for emotional and cognitive regulation. We should practice a self-inventory and an inventory of our own experience event. Triggers and or stresses present in various ways and the manifestations differ for each of us. Our bodies respond in diverse ways that range from an acute appearance or chronic events, life events, personal experiences, worldview, and cultural lifestyle can influence how we respond and manage triggers and or stresses. So putting self-inventory into action, we should take stock in our personal strengths, personal interests, life experiences, likes and dislikes about oneself and life events, we then should ask ourselves, what is my why? Where do I see my benefits? And what makes me move through the day? As a part of the self inventory, we should go deeper by using helping skills. These skills are adopted from Lauren Schulman, who created the helping model for child welfare workers. He saw that these skills were essential to the engagement and interactional processes. There are nine interactional helping skills. We are going to focus on two. These skills provide perspective, empathy, and self-regulation. The purpose of these helping skills is to assist with the parallel processing. What we see, feel, hear and experience. The first helping skill is tuning into self. The purpose and role of this helping skill is to build and strengthen self-awareness and emotional regulation. How do we use this? Well, we purposefully stop and think about what thoughts feelings, and or practices are influencing my responses. When do we use this? Well, when we are full of emotion, but are unable to articulate feelings that are felt. When we feel like we're in a hole and there's no way out. Lastly, when we are experiencing little to no effect. The second helping skill is tuning into others. This helping skill is as important to the first. The purpose and role of this helping skill is to build and strengthen empathy. Now, how do we use this one? Very similar to the first. We want to first explore what possible feelings or thoughts the other may be experiencing. Also explore the other's possible emotion, physical, and or cognitive reactions to a situation or event. Then we would like to focus on listening to what encourages the others to talk. So we or you can identify the most primary or most basic part of the other's thoughts, 
feelings, events, or actions. The last part is that we want to display our understanding, our perceived or actual feelings of the others. Display your understanding of the individual's feelings. And we do this by reflecting or asking for clarification on what you have identified as the individual's primary feeling, the other's feeling. When do we use this? We use this when we are unsure and we need clarification. When we or you feel that you have conveyed the wrong message. And lastly, when we want to allow for opportunities to create a felt or even perceived security and wellness. Dr. Sandra Bloom is the creator of the Sanctuary Model, which includes safety planning as a part of self-care. Today we are using the term social support plan so that it is not to be confused with the safety planning used in the school district of Philadelphia. The social support plan is a form of prevention and self-preservation. By creating this plan, you are focusing on what is needed to move throughout your hardest moments. We know that teaching can be mentally and emotionally demanding, and this is a reminder to practice self-planning. Hi there, I'm Dr. Sandra Bloom. I'm Associate Professor of Health Management and Policy at the Dornsife School of Public Health Drexel University. I'm going to talk to you about a tool that's called a safety plan. The goal of completing a safety plan is to reduce workplace stress and do what you can to reduce the stress on you and on other people. The idea behind this is about creating a safety culture. And a safety culture is one in which our values and our attitudes and our behaviors support a safe, engaged workforce and reliable, error-free operations, whatever we do at work. The way we think about safety are there are four key domains. The one you're accustomed to is physical safety, like keeping yourself safe and watching out for danger. But there are other kinds of safety that are really important. Being safe with yourself, psychological safety, being safe with other people, social safety, and being safe with a system of values that really support the way you get through life. A Little bit about emotions. Emotions are hardwired. We are always feeling things. They are part of our physical and, and mental being. They are associated with faces. Every time we feel a feeling, we have a specific facial expression, and that's tied to reactions within our bodies. I'm going to show you a picture of the ways in which our bodies respond to different emotions. And you'll see that different parts of our body light up depending on what we're feeling. So anger and fear is associated with, in this picture, yellow and red, which would kind of be what most of us think about, <laughs> what we feel, the way we flush when we're really upset with anger or rage. And then depression, you'll see, and sadness are, are blue. So it's not a coincidence that we say we get the blues when we're really sad. What's important about this in the workplace is that emotions are contagious. We catch each other's feelings. It's a basic part of human biology. And it happens before we even know what we're doing. We automatically mimic and we synchronize our facial expressions and our tone of voice and our postures and our movements with those of another person. And then when that happens, we feel the same emotions that they are feeling. We are especially vulnerable to expressions of anger, fear, and disgust. And that's really because those emotions on somebody else's face in our early evolutionary environment conveyed danger to us. And it was really important that we tune into what it is 
that they are angry about or fearful of or disgusted by because disgust begins with food really of being disgusted by a bad taste which could be poisonous so we're very vulnerable to those kinds of feelings in anybody else and when we see those feelings we experience emotional contagion and basically our emotions get hijacked before we even know it we're feeling somebody else's feelings and we're likely to act on those feelings. So we fall into the rhythm with them and we're still not consciously aware that we're doing it. And then that makes it much more likely that we will act without thinking. Because regardless of how old we are or our ethnicity or our gender or our experience or how educated we are, when we become emotionally upset, our thinking brains don't work well. And we can do and say things that we later regret. Who among you hasn't done that, right? This is what makes safety plans so important. Safety plans are simple tools that can keep people safe by helping us regulate our own emotions before we lose control. So let me tell you what we want you to do. You're gonna create your own safety plan. I want you to first assess your present skills. Identify what happens in your body. How do you know you'd better calm down before you lose it? What are the signals that your body gets that alert you to, uh-oh, I may be picking up somebody else's feeling and reacting to it. The second step is to identify your things that are called triggers, situations that are likely to very quickly overload you with negative emotions. So what are your danger zones? What are the situations that may provoke powerful and, and distress in you? What interpersonal boundaries do you need to maintain that keep you safe? And what emotions might you find particularly challenging? And then in the next step, we want you to create some, what I've called detours, right? How to keep you from being in that hijacked emotional state. So here's what to do. I want you to list five or six things you can do when feeling unsafe to maintain your own safety. Most importantly, things that you can do on your own to self-regulate. I want you to include things that can be done without a lot of thought and in many different situations without being in any way embarrassing. Choose some sensory items. I have some examples here of what are called widgets, right? They, they just things that you can hold in your hand, keep in your pocket, keep in your purse and just kind of play with. They're otherwise toys, but really useful. Here's a stress ball really useful when we are tense. Here's a magnetic thing, pull things apart and bring it back. And then here's a funny widget that allows you to do a whole lot of different things. So get a couple of those, the ones that you like, that are distracting, that you can associate with a calm state. Other people like something they can smell or, or sounds that they can hear, or even things they can taste or do something with your body. Choose something that takes you elsewhere in your mind. Maybe a prayer or a picture of a loved one or a meditation. Choose a physical action like breathing, um, massaging your hands, pacing around if you're able to do that um, in that situation. And have a number of these available on your safety plan. So five to six that you can use whenever you feel, get that signal from your body that your emotions are escalating. And then keep your list nearby as a reminder. Put it on your refrigerator, a lot of people put it on with their ID badges, somewhere in your pocket that you can know what is it that I'm supposed to do and remind yourself when you already feel yourself beginning to escalate. And if you can, share your safety plans within your team. Teamwork improves safety. And that's what it's all about, really, creating and maintaining a safe workplace for you and for everybody else. It's all of our responsibility. So let's talk about social support plans. A social support plan can be an actual piece of paper that involves three coping skills, and you can place this in view of the student and teacher. 
So for example, during virtual learning, you can place it on your laptop. Each morning, you can review the social support plan to further practice coping skills. Here is an example, Kermit the Frog. When I become frustrated, I need to take a walk, have a drink of water, and massage my hands at my seat. Students will mirror your emotions. Consider the following strategies to help reduce the impact of stressors. Take time to check in with yourself to gain insight in any areas where you may be struggling. Utilize social supports as needed. Consider planning a virtual coffee break or lunch hour with colleagues. Remember that as adults, we can be the best guides for our students. They're watching us. Lastly, give yourself and your students grace. Remember, emotions are contagious. Here is an example on how to use these practices in your classroom. Incorporating two to three minutes of coping skills practices throughout the day will increase proficiency of use over time. Personal reflection activities to begin the morning or scheduling quiet time to unwind. So what have we learned? Having self-awareness is important. We all respond differently. Planning ahead and practicing frequently can help during dysregulation. You do not need to go at this alone. We are here for help. For further support, contact the Offices of Prevention and Intervention in the STEP program for additional strategies and resources.